say one again for for coming and thanks to, to Neil for agreeing to to do this the last in um our seminar series frontiers in educational technology um so i'll now uh, hand over performing introductions and then let Neil get get on with his talk thanks everyone Great, thank you now for the introduction. Thank you everyone for being here in our last seminar of the Frontiers of Education series. My name is Zosin Yi. I'm a current student of the Digital and Social Change Pathway and a co-organizer of the seminar series. I just would like to remind everyone to mute your microphone during the presentation. There will also be a 30 minute Q&A after Dr. Sowen's uh, talk. And just to do a quick introduction, um, Professor Neil Sowen is a distinguished professor in the Faculty of Education at Monash University. For the past 25 years, he has been researching the integration of digital technology into schools, universities, and adult learning. He's recognized as a leading international researcher in the area of digital education, with particular expertise in the real-life constraints and problems faced when technology-based education is implemented. He's currently working on nationally funded projects, examining the rollout of educational data and learning analytics, AI technologies, and the changing nature of teachers' digital work. So the theme of today's talk is rethinking the digitization of education in the era of climate crisis, um, in which Professor Solon would share some initial thoughts on an ex existential challenge that he thinks everyone working around the topic of digital education needs to start taking more seriously. Namely, is the continued use of digital technology in education part of a realistic, livable future, or even a sur even just a survivable planet? And if so, in what form? So without further ado, Professor Sowen. Um. Thanks very much. Um, that was um, that's really lovely to be here. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, did I write that myself? Recognized as a leading, leading international scholar. That's a bit um, boastful, isn't it? Sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure why, why. As you were reading it, I thought, oh dear. What, what, I could just see Niall's face laughing. It's lovely to be here. Um, thanks ever so much for having having me on. I've got a really bad cold, so I'm not sure I can possibly manage 30 minutes Q&A as well, but I will try my best. Um, and also, I'm not going to do it with slides, which is going to be interesting, but it'll be fine. As um, you just said, I would want to talk about something that I don't usually talk about. Um, I've been working actually in ed tech since 1995 which is 27 years, is um, terrible, various lines of critical inquiry around technology and education. And basically, I've spent 27 years pointing out why technology doesn't work, how things could be better, et cetera, et cetera. But having moved over to Australia 10 years ago, it really gave me this visceral personal wake up call about climate crisis. We had a whole range of bushfires, flooding, um, and I, I quickly became mindful, more so than when I lived in, in Europe, of the need to get my own area of work up to speed with issues around climate change, sustainability, possible eco-compromised futures, to go all these things that we talk about. So rather than talk about digital divide and the stuff that I usually do, the fundamental challenge that I'm currently trying to get my head around and the challenge that I'm going to now burden you with is quite ter terrifyingly simple in a way. I've written this down. Is ed tech part of a realistic, livable future? Or is it even part of just a survivable planet? And if so, in what form? So, I mean, we can talk about screen time, platformatization, critical data literacies, high flex, anything else that we talk about in ed tech that we like. But I suspect that climate change is going to be the urgent ed tech issue that will trump all the other urgent ed tech issues over the next few decades. So I guess I'm starting this from the premise that ed tech is not a good thing. In fact, I'm starting this from the premise, I think that ed tech that we currently have in the global north, because the distinction needs to be made that I am talking from a global north perspective, the ed tech we have is based around, I think, a really dangerous, excessive consumption of technology. And the current do dominant models, if you think about the current dom dominant models of ed tech, in the global north are based around excessive use of technology. We're always on. We have infinite cloud storage. We're constantly streaming. We've got multiple devices. We have, we're second screening, we're third screening. We have these cornucopian assumptions of an ever expanding ed tech complex. The work that we do never actually talks about scaling down. We always talk about scaling up. And the current dom dominant models I think of ed tech are a double whammy. So in terms of social sustainability, the current models of ed tech consumption are hugely disadvantaging, I think, 
to the already disadvantaged. If you look at how COVID played out in the global north and the, the switch to remote schooling, we can see from the data that lots of very well resourced middle class families did very well. But there were a whole bunch of other social groups that were actually profoundly disadvantaged by having to learn online. Also, the second bit of the double whammy, in terms of environmental sustainability, the current models of excessive education technology consumption are hugely problematic in terms of e-waste, energy drain, rare metals and minerals being you know, mined and, and making up our device, all the material and all the planetary limitations of the digital. And I think if you put the two together, we have a huge problem. And it's not just an ed tech problem, and I'll come to that later, but I think it's something that all of us working in ed tech need to start thinking about a little bit more seriously than we do. Because at the moment, the main kind of progressive, socially concerned lines of thought in our field are very much based around the idea that digital education is a means of more inclusive, fairer, better forms of education. So if you look at the SDG 4s um, goals, for example, we can see that digital technology is, is writ large throughout SDG 4. So the 2015 Ichanon um, Declaration made a big play. The same old boosterism that you hear about technology from the 90s and the 2000s, you know, we must harness ICTs to strengthen education systems. There was a 2018 analysis by Huawei, the, the uh, Chinese tech company. They reckoned SDG 4 had some of the highest levels of correspondence with digital technology use across all 17 SDG goals. And actually they thought IT, ICT would make the biggest impact in SDG 4. And we're still seeing hype now in the um, social development goals around what Web3 could possibly do, what AI could possibly do. We need augmented reality for all of this rubbish. Now, I'm not sure this is the way forward, which is what I'm going to talk about now. And I think more tech is never the answer to any set of problems, let alone this particular set of problems. Tech's not going to save us. and The SDGs are not going to save us, but we need to rethink what we're doing around radically different lines. So if you let... Uh, humor me a bit more i'll just talk through the logic of what i'm grappling with in a little bit more detail and this is not very well thought out i've only ever done this talk once before um a couple of weeks ago so i'm um, feel free to point out huge flaws in this argument but i've got a couple of propositions proposition number one digital technology as we know it in the global north in education is clearly a problem so we know this in social terms the key logics of digital technology in education I don't think make education fairer or make education more just. So the key logics that we're seeing now in the dominant forms of ed tech are individualization, standardization, synchronization, monitoring, datification, platform, you know, all of these things. The key outcomes of all of this, I think, are exacerbations of existing social inequalities, exacerbations of existing social harms. So we're seeing increased discrimination and oppression of minoritized groups, for example, along the lines of race, disability, neurodiversity, non-binary and all the intersections. And we're also seeing new harms being brought in, something like algorithmic discrimination, for example. I'm doing lots of work on facial recognition technology, which is bringing in new harms into education settings. So socially, I think digital technology and education is proving to be a disaster in the form that we currently have it. And we also know in terms of education, I think that the current forms of digital technology we have are fundamentally debasing and degrading education. So it's not just a social problem, it's an education problem. If you think about the, the dominant forms of ed tech that we see in schools and universities, Teams is a fantastic example, horrible piece of software as I'm now proving, but you know, Google, Classroom, Moodle, Canvas, personalized learning systems, plagiarism detection software, learning analytics, the whole bunch of um, copware, which was now being brought into schools and universities to surveil students. Student activity monitoring systems is something I'm getting quite interested in. Online exam proctoring, horrible, horrible software. And there's a whole bunch of bossware as well that's used to kind of surveil workers. So teachers are just as much surveilled as students. None of this technology, I would argue, makes the education experience more engaging or exciting or, you know, inquisitive, serendipitous or inspiring. Instead, we have standardized things like Google Classroom, which I think are just horrible. They're pernicious, predatory, extractive, exploitative and everything else. And I think they're hollowing out the human experience of, of learning. So you've got these two things, the social degradation, the education degradation. Those two things are bad enough, but when 
I think the third side of the the argument is the big elephant in the room, and that's the the kind of environmental consequences of all of this. So I think we've got not optimum technology. I think we've got horrible technology doing horrible things, and then actually having much more wide environmental consequences. As I've already just hinted, ed tech in the global north is based around this excessive model of everything being always on and you know, constant expansion. And I think this all comes, and we know this, at a huge environmental and ecological cost. And I think we need to talk much more about the increasingly unsustainable energy and resource demands of this continued digital technology development. So the technologies that we use are increasingly bringing in problems of energy drain. They're resource intensive, extractive and exploitative logics of having more technology. Now, we know this at the moment because of uh, crypto cryptocurrency and bitcoin you see these headlines you know bitcoin has the annual annual energy consumption of a country like norway i think bitcoin has the an, an annual energy consumption 13th country biggest country in the world bitcoin is an extreme example it's absolutely insane how that has environmental consequences but it's not the only element of technology that actually i think is environmentally excessive and is storing up problems further on down the track i think all technology needs to be seen in a similar light so even standard AI modeling for the, the kind of current scope of a, a deep learning technique, which is now kind of considered normal, the estimation for training one of these AI deep learning models at the moment is 100 billion US dollars and a carbon emission equivalent to one month of New York City. You think about the storage, the storing things in the cloud. The cloud's not ephemeral. There's a real cost of the huge data storage centers that you see all around the world, often in the most driest and water poor areas of, of, um, of the world using excessive energy and excessive water. And then think about the device production, the mining of rare minerals, the, the mining, of, uh, mining of rare materials. 80% of energy is expended in the production of a device, not its use. And then if you think about the environmental consequences of disposal of devices and e-waste and all of it, put it all together. And I think the continued excessive application of digital technology in any context from Bitcoin all the way down to education, is beginning to make less and less sense in time in terms of environmental sustainability. So I think this is my kind of per first proposition coming to an end. Given how crappy ed tech is currently, it doesn't make any sense for us to carry on using it if it's also causing this huge environmental damage as well. So I think, this is my second proposition, and this was the title of the first paper I wrote on this, ed tech is killing us. The main thing then to think about is what are people like us, and I say people like us in scare quotes, but, you know, progressive minded, thoughtful people that work around education technology in, in reasonably critical ways. What are people like us doing about it? So on the one hand, most people like us are super aware of all these issues. We're progressively minded. You know, we're very concerned about climate politics. We're aware of the need to carbon offset. I'd have loved to have flown over to Oxford to give this talk, but that doesn't make, give, make any environmental sense at all. We're aware of the horrors of mining and fossil fuels and air travel and meat-based diets and all the rest of it. But we nevertheless replicate this really curious unwillingness amongst the kind of climate concerned middle classes to implicate digital technology into all of our concerns. I've got some great quotes here from John Crary, Jonathan Crary, who wrote a book called Scorched Earth, but he wrote, many of us who understand the urgency of transitioning to some form of eco-socialism carelessly presume that the internet and all its current applications and services will somehow persist and function as usual in the future, alongside our efforts for a more hab hab habitable planet and more egalitarian social arrangements. So we just assume that, yeah, we did make all these other changes, but we'll still be using shed loads of technology. Why not even more? And it just doesn't make any sense over the next few decades. So at the present time, I don't see many people in our area really talking about this in academic ed tech circles, We're not really addressing these, these issues of climate change, let alone doing anything about it. And I can understand this. I, you know, I, I, that was me about six months ago before I kind of got on this hobby horse. But the climate crisis is too huge a thing to really properly get our heads around. Most people's instinctive response is, you know, either cognitive dissonance or disavowal. You, you know something, but you don't want to know it or you don't know what to do about it. You just, we're in that kind of um, no man's land. But I think we are all implicated in this every way that we do stuff. So I don't really want to carry on doing what I'm doing, which is researching education and technology with this huge elephant in the room. 
all my other bits of work, really, the conclusions are we need more technology. So I've done lots of work in digital divide, for example. The conclusion of that normally is we need people that are not using technology so much to make more use of it. So in a way, I'm just a salesperson for the thing I'm now arguing against. So I don't really want our professional field to carry on this way. And I think actually our professional field can play a really useful part in shifting the dial across societies. So and it's also a selfish thing. I think I've got about 15 years left of my working life and I actually want to do something useful. But what? This is the problem. What do we do? And this is where it all grinds, grinds to a halt. So I've got three responses to this dilemma that I think we could begin to think about or our field is beginning to acknowledge a little bit. And I think none of them are good. And I think I've got another three possible responses afterwards. But three immediate responses, if you take everything I've just said seriously and kind of go along with it, three immediate responses spring to mind. I think how we will respond is business as usual. I think clearly we're being compelled to not really take this seriously. We're being compelled to carry on doing the same old thing and hope everything's going to get better. And I think that's what's most likely to happen. And so everybody with a vested interest in, in ed tech will blithely carry on regardless and feed you know, more innovation, more expansion of education technology and hope everything's going to turn out for the better. If that's what happens, I can really only anticipate bad things. I, don't, I can't see how we can carry on ever expanding ed tech, having an ed tech that's ever more abundant, ever more extractive, ever more exploitative. We can't carry on indefinitely. And I think when we reach the tipping point where we, we, we go from abundance to scarcity, we'll see some form of ed tech hunger games. Decent technology use will become even more the preserve of the elite and the entitled. And it will be the survival of the most well resourced. So there'll be a real bun fight to see who can actually have, you know, online education or who can have kind of, you know, one device per child, everything else. And you know who it's going to be. It's going to be the usual suspects, the Oxford universities of the world and everything else. You know, and, and lots of kind of elite global North actors. And I, I, I don't think that is a good thing. Business as usual is really bleak if you think it through in the next few decades. The second immediate response, and you are beginning to see people think about this, is a real faith in green technology, you know, eco growth and that some form of eco green form of education technology. You're occasionally beginning to hear people say this. And this is the idea that we can develop more ecologically friendly means of energy consumption. We can have cleaner models of uh, cleaner training of AI models, sustainable device production, recycling. So this is the idea that ed tech can kind of tap into broader ideas of the, you know, the circular economy or eco growth. And you're seeing technology use in education begin to be justified as you know, it can make a positive con contribution to climate action. You know, it'll hasten universities to net zero. You know, the climate, the carbon footprint will be reduced if students don't have to kind of commute and travel into campuses and turn on the lights and everything else. We can do everything via Zoom. And you see these arguments made quite a lot that actually digital learning is, is the way forward. It can save resources and climate and carbon emissions, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I don't buy into this at all. I don't think the idea to, uh, that a solution to a climate crisis, which is actually off, much of which has been caused by technology, the solution is more technology. That sounds off. And we know this from kind of techno solutionism. You know, tech is not going to save us. More tech is not going to get us out of this. But there is a kind of uh, and sustainability people call it Promethean, Prometheanism, this kind of an idea that the planet can be saved by technology, this geoengineering mindset that we can actually kind of you know, get rid of um, climate change with, with more technology that will block out the sun or whatever else. I think I'm, I'm really sceptical of this. Um, a lot of, I think, climate promises by the big tech companies, because you've got big tech companies saying, oh, we'll be carbon neutral by 2050. We'll have um, water neutral um, data centers by 2030, blah, blah, blah. There is an argument that all these climate promises is a new form of climate denial. People, these big companies don't no longer say, well, there is no such problem, but they now start making promises, which they will never keep. We've had tech firms making promises for decades that we'll have green tech and zero carbon computing and everything else. I don't think it's going to work. Now, this is actually an obvious position for our field to gravitate towards. So I'm not dismissing it out of hand. If this is the, if that's the position you're going to take, that green tech is the answer, I really think we can't assume it will just suddenly work out okay. If you subscribe to this particular way of thinking, then I think you urgently need to start 
researching it in you know, implementing it and seeing how it works i don't really think it's going to work but i'll be super happy to be proven wrong so i think when i gave this talk like a few weeks ago everyone's go oh no 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 we've got all these you know google have promised to have uh, carbon neutral computing by 20 great let's do it then let's really start implementing that in ed tech rather than just assuming it's going to happen because we can't afford to be wrong on this i personally think it's rubbish but go ahead and knock yourselves out and have a go at that the third thing, and this is because I'm quite an extreme person, I always look to the worst case scenarios. You are seeing arguments of, well, if that's the case, let's burn it all to the ground and have no technology whatsoever. And I'm quite, in some ways, I'm quite attracted to that idea um, just because I'm quite extreme. But this is the argument that, all right, if any form of digital technology in the future is going to be toxic, any form of digital technology used in the future is going to be irredeemable. And that's where this um, Jonathan Crary book comes in. I haven't got it to hand at the moment. It's a really good book, Scorched Earth. Really bleak prognosis. There is no hope, regardless of what we do in the forthcoming decades in climate change, climate collapse. We can't have the digital infrastructure that we have now. There'll be power outages, brownouts, blackouts, flooding, wind, wildfire. If you imagine a world like that, the digital will just be disappearing in front of our eyes, regardless of how clean or green or eco growth you can be. And if that's the way forward, we need to prepare now for having no technology, no digital technology. We need to learn to do without technology altogether. Now, that's a really interesting argument. He's not saying there'll be no communication or information sharing or knowledge creation. But there is argument that these practices are going to have to take place in radically different ways. So we'll need to go offline, off grid, low tech, much more analog in form, this kind of prepper ideal. I'm interested in that because Crary anticipates things like new community based education, which is as an interhuman project based around what he says is a material hybrid material culture based on old and new ways of living and subsisting cooperatively. So in some ways, the kind of nihilist in me quite likes this idea. It's a nice, interesting way of thinking genuinely post digital, i.e. digital no longer exists. But I want to retain a little bit of hope. This is a that's a little bit too preppy preppy prepper um, for, for my liking. I want to retain a small hope that education technology in new forms, in forms that are sustainable, in forms that we can keep going, can be of an advantage and particularly can be of an advantage to those who are otherwise disadvantaged. So I want to rethink how we might have more scaled down forms of ed tech that might fit better with the constrained environmental situation that we may well find ourselves in over forthcoming decades and use them in ways that address those earlier two issues I was talking about in terms of social sustainability and the education degradation. Because I think we can still use tech, but we just really need to rethink how we do it. So that brings me to the three other things which I'm beginning to think about now, which are no more kind of um, tangible than the other three I've just outlined, but I think could be a bit more fruitful. And these are just, I'll quickly go through them. There are big literatures around all of these, not in education. So all I'm really doing is looking at literatures around tech and sustainability and trying to bring them into the ed tech purview. So there's a really interesting literature around digital sufficiency and computing within limits. And I had a paper, I think last year, which was called ed tech within limits. And that was using this idea of computing within limits, which is a really interesting kind of mishmash of computer science people, sustainability people, people working in ICT for D, seeing environmental and social harms together. So the idea of computing within limits is, is planning future technology use with a primary aim of what they call coping with finiteness. So you reconfigure the priorities and the values and the practices of edtech around the idea of it being a finite, scarce resource rather than an abundant, expanding resource. And there's some really interesting parallels here with what Tillman Santaris calls digital sufficiency. And this is the idea of the absolute reduction of resource and energy demands, but in ways that can kind of maintain general living conditions or perhaps even improve living conditions and opportunities for us to all lead flourishing lives. And so um, Santaris and other people talk about hardware sufficiency, designing hardware that's just, that can last a long time, that's robust, that's repairable, that's modular, modular that can actually be um, reused and repurposed. He talks about software sufficiency, the idea of programming in ways that are much more parsimonious. We've got this era of bloatware now where programmers just kind of copy and paste and shed loads of code. They're not really bothered about you know, RAM size or memory size like we used to be in the 80s. Software sufficiency flips it on its head and tries to 
code in the most sleek minimalist way that's the most parsimonious in terms of the energy demands that the code uses which is a really interesting way of thinking of going back to kind of very basic forms of programming he also talks about user sufficiency where we support users to be more um, frugal in their use of technology and also this idea of destabilizing the data economy and the digital economy and try and disrupt um, the ways in which excessive education uh, excessive technology use is used for economic purposes so i really like those literatures and they also feed into a second literature, which is around the idea of eco-justice, which again is another really interesting idea to rethink ed tech through. And this is seeing environmental and social harms together. So we're not just talking about a climate emergency. And the danger of talking too much about climate change is it means we, we focus exclusively on climate crisis. Mike Hume calls this climate determinism. We fixate on the idea that we just need to kind of enact a lot of climate action points and at some point we can get back to normal. But the idea of eco-justice argues that we need to see climate collapse as just another permanent condition that we're entering into. So we need to deal with climate collapse alongside social disadvantage, economic inequality, human rights and all the other catastrophes and emergencies that are running parallel at the same time. So eco-justice reframes our environmental concerns with technology as societal humanitarian concerns and then gets us to this idea of how can we have future forms of ed tech that are addressing issues of social justice and environmental reparation? And I think if you think about ed tech in terms of eco justice, again, it pushes us away from the dominant global north excessive forms of ed tech that we currently have and makes us think about what ed tech could be like if it was much smaller, but also if it was much more communal and collective and based around kind of. Um, kind of commutarian ways of decision making and managing how resources are actually used and deployed in education. And if we think about ed tech that's self-determined and based around the self-determination of access of resorts, resources and control of resources, you can actually think about really interesting ways that we begin to reimagine and refashion forms of ed tech that are appropriate for future decades where climate crisis is just one thing we're suddenly having to deal with extra. So it's not just about making less use of technology in education. It's about thinking about how to make less use of technology for more just education outcomes. So if we only have a finite amount of technology to use, where do we use it? If, for example, you think really we shouldn't be disadvantaging global South communities that have already been disadvantaged by technology use, then perhaps Ed, the EdTech community focuses its efforts on fostering sustainable and socially appropriate forms of education technology for the global south. If we are also going to have technology still used in education in, in the global north, perhaps we need to focus on more disadvantaged groups that stand to benefit most from the use of EdTech and actually flip side stand to benefit, stand to lose most if we actually take technology away. So some of you might think, well, you know, technology is particularly good for particular disabilities, for example. Well, that's great. Let's use technology for particular groups of students that will benefit most from it, not everybody. It makes you think about if technology is finite, where would you use it? And actually, this is just a, a sidebar. I got thinking about that three years ago when I was in, in uh, Melbourne in the, in the summer. We had big wildfires and we had an email come round from our chief information officer saying there will be no uh, data blackouts and energy brownouts over the next week. Only use essential technology. And I was thinking, what the hell is essential technology? Is it me in the faculty of education tapping away and you know, writing a paper? Or is it the scientists over in the science department, you know, solving whatever it is they do, climate change and cancer? We have a heart hospital now built on campus. I would assume if there is going to be any kind of finite use of technology, the heart hospital gets first dibs. But it really got me thinking about well, if you prioritise all this education technology use, what what's worth keeping and what's not worth keeping? And, and eco justice is a similar kind of way. And last of all, I'm really interested in this idea of degrowth as well, which is actually a much more radical approach, but really, really interesting. And I've hopefully got a paper coming out soon about degrowth and ed tech. I'm really interested about how ideas of degrowth might apply to reimagine sustainable forms of education technology. And the key motivation here is decoupling education technology from imperatives of economic growth. So it's kind of imagining a, a post capitalist form of ed tech, which the degrowthers um, see as going to be inevitable in terms of where, where we're going in the next few decades. 
And so degrowth, again, calls for a proactive renewal of technology use around a voluntary kind of simplicity and voluntary slowing down of what we do. Community based co-production and sharing conscious minimalization of resource consumption. And actually, a lot of this comes from Ivan Illich. So Ivan Illich talked about convivial technologies, for example. So degrowth is a really kind of into convivial technologies. And by that, Illich meant tools that are totally understandable and locally manageable and controllable by individuals and communities. The flip side of that is what he called manipulative tools, which are not understandable, manageable or controllable. So if you think about the, the digital tech we have at the moment, that's a very, very manipulative tool. We can't even get into the black box, let alone do stuff to, to make it better. He also talked about um, commons, the commons, the digital commons and the, and the, the non-digital commons, the management of shared resources um, that are open to the whole community. A lot of this is based around autonomy. So the idea of tools and technologies that boost collective autonomies and collective freedoms. And also the idea of care comes in, in in the degrowth literature as well. Communities taking care of resources and resources used to care for others. Now, degrowth is a really interesting way of thinking about edtech because some degrowthers are really ambivalent or if not hostile to digital technology altogether. So there are some factions of the degrowth literature that just says you know there's no such thing as digital degrowth it's an anathema but there are some really interesting de digital degrowth principles i think that might frame future thinking around ed tech how can we identify and get rid of obviously manipulative technologies in education how can we bolster existing convivial forms of education technology i think actually the the essential um convivial tool for the de for degrowth is, is is the bicycle so what's the ed tech bicycle? It could possibly be the Raspberry Pi, but we're talking about those forms of computing. And how can we actually stimulate the development of new convivial technologies? Now, the logical flaw to degrowth is that ultimately it wants to achieve the eventual de-schooling of society. Illich is most famous for arguing that schools and universities are the ultimate manipulative technology. So if you take this to its logical conclusion, we need to get rid of schools and universities as well which I'm quite happy to do. Um, you may be less happy to do if you're <laughs> looking to work in one. But there's some interesting kind of political arguments here that it's not just about digital tech, it's about the technologies of of, um, of, of schooling, all told. Now, it's, it's, it's really interesting to think about these ideas. It's much more difficult to talk about what they tangibly might mean. So I'm not entirely sure what a degrowth ed tech might look like or, a, or an eco-justice ed tech might look like. There are some interesting communities online that are forming around ideas of radically sustainable computing. So the idea of collapse informatics, for example, is a whole bunch of computer science people trying to talk about preparedness approaches to computing, building systems now in the abundant present that might later prove durable for subsequent time, times of scarcity. So kind of really robust um, local mesh Wi-Fi networks, for example. There's also a whole range of people talking about permacomputing which is applying principles of permaculture to the digital domain. And that's trying to invent technologies that are much less reliant on artificial energy and are designed in ways that acknowledge inter interdependence with natural systems and energy resources and land. So one of the interesting things there is the, the solar powered website, for example, which has different solar panels around the world. But the website only works when there's sun in those locations. And when there isn't sun, you don't use the website. That's really interesting. So what would EdTech look like if it's more connected to land, if it's more connected to the environment? Which brings in a whole bunch of indigenous knowledges and there's a whole interesting ways you can spin off there. So there are some really interesting things to think of. And there are some interesting examples from the from the Raspberry Pi through to, you know, I've, I've found a, a slow social media platform called Minus, um, which restricts participants to a lifetime limit of 100 posts. That's the kind of degrowth technology. You've only got 100 posts, use them wisely. Why not? Anyway, I don't know where we're heading in the future, but I think I do think it's possible to work out what we should be doing right now. And the whole point of even anticipating anything future orientated is to kind of think about what, how we should be acting, acting in the moment. So just to finish off with, I think what I'm going to do at the moment is try and think these things through properly, get the arguments right. But I think we can first of all illuminate these issues. I think we as researchers in edtech should be accounting for and documenting current harms of these excessive mode of global north edtech that I was talking about and also try and account for and document alternatives, get conversations started. 
even just saying these things out loud, I think is a start. We can model these things in our own practices. I'm a big fan of having cameras off, reduces bandwidth and environmental um, excesses of online lecturing. And we can pursue the ideas of some of these alt to ed tech ideas in the, I wasn't saying turn your cameras off, so I wasn't, um, wasn't uh, being nasty, someone did. Um, we can have our cameras on now. We can burn the planet for a few, for a little bit longer. But we can maybe pursue some of these ideas in the cracks. And there's a degrowth idea of nowtopias. So you kind of work to nurture alternative forms of ed tech in the cracks of capitalism. So why not try and pursue what the Raspberry Pi could really be used for if we, we, we really went for it and other forms of um, ed tech. So illuminate, we can anticipate as well. I think we need to think here uh, and use anticipatory methods to think about futures, plural. The future is unknowable. So the key approach here really is anticipation. And I think one of the key things is to get these issues into conversations about education futures. Education futures is a big thing at the moment. We've got the UNESCO um, futures conversation going on, OECD, World Bank. We need to get climate issues into conversations around education technology futures. And the last thing I think is agitate. I think it's really important to try and be a little bit activist about this, to kind of shake the progressive middle class ed tech community in the global north out of its complacency. This is clearly a thing. This is clearly an issue, but we need to work out exactly what it is. And I suspect most right minded people in ed tech do know this, but we need to agitate a bit and help people make connections and get the climate crisis community and degrowth community into conversation with ed tech and you know, what the communities that we're part of. So I think there's lots of work to do. And this is what I want to spend the rest of my 15 years doing. We need to move beyond resignation and apathy and we need to be realistic, but we also need to be a bit resistant. And I think for me, making the decision not to be cynical about this, which is my default mode, is actually really difficult. And to be hopeful about this is really, really difficult. I quite like the Jonathan Crary scorched earth. We're all screwed. Let's just get rid of technology. But that's a cynical cop out. I think we have to remain hopeful about what we could possibly do with different forms of technology. But that makes you really vulnerable actually makes even me saying these things out loud make it look like I've slightly lost the plot. But I think having hope around these issues um, is the most possibly adversarial stand we can take. So I really want to take, keep talking about this in ed tech conversations. Ed tech isn't the only place we need to be doing this, but I think there's a, a if you want to talk about it in the questions, I'm quite happy to argue why I think ed tech needs to be doing this, even though we're not Bitcoin, we're not the massive offender. But education is a really interesting place to start doing these kind of things for lots of reasons. So we need to start talking about these issues, writing about these issues, include them in our research, include them in our practice. I don't think this is an issue that's going to go away. So we need to get properly engaged. Anyway, that's me done. Thank you for listening. Sorry there wasn't any slides, but they were more of a distraction than um, they weren't really essential. So I'm happy to have a conversation. Don't ask questions. I have no idea what we do. <laughs> That's the whole point of the talk. Great. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, I think we already have some hands raised. So this is just a reminder that if you have a comment or you want to engage in the conversation, just use the hand raise button and I would call on people by the order. And Victoria? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your talk and thank you for talking to us, even though you're ill. That's really nice of you. I was so excited for your talk, so I'm really glad that you didn't cancel. Um, I was wondering, my question is, like, if you take as the end goal the reduction of technology consumption from, from the perspective of the environment, uh, do you think that the most effectful way to do that is to appeal to arguments from uh, climate concerns? Or do you think that the most effectful way to get there is to appeal from arguments that technology does not actually achieve what the claims are that they would do in terms of uh, better education or in terms of promoting uh, better access to education. Like, do you think that the policy community is more susceptible to arguments from like, it's actually bad for the purpose of education? Or do you think that the policies climate is such that they're more susceptible to arguments from the environment? Um, it's a very good question. Um, clearly, we can keep arguing on all fronts. So I've been doing this since 1995, and I've been arguing since 1995 that technology is not a good thing socially, um, politically, culturally, et cetera, et cetera. And for the first 20 odd years, no one listened at all. 
or, or really cared. And I was seen to be a, a Luddite or, you know, didn't understand technology and everything's going to be different. And, and so those arguments have fallen on deaf ears consistently. There is a slight shift. I don't know if you've noticed in the last year or two with things like UNESCO and the UN, actually, and, and some of the, the conversations we're seeing around data valence and platformatization and, and look, there is a cri the critical ed tech thing is kind of having a little moment but i'm not sure it's really making any difference and so one of the things i'm beginning to think is that um being critical about ed tech is actually part of the problem um so maybe i'm the you know that mitchell and webb sketch am I, are we the baddies um when the german nazi offices i th i've kind of thought maybe i'm the baddie because it really benefits big tech to be critiqued at the moment. So big tech is quite happy for us to critique it. Um, and, and ed tech is the same. Um, as long as you don't fundamentally say we do not need technology anymore. So Lee Vincell, who's an STS scholar in the States, writes really nicely about this. He calls it critty hype. That by drawing attention to the bad parts of technology actually just promotes them more. And engaging critically with you know socio-technical imaginaries of what people are saying could happen, promote them more. So if if we start putting too much attention to oh did you know that they're looking for emotion detection through AI and it's going to be brought into classrooms and they'll work out when students are feeling bored, even if you're being critical about it, you're promoting that idea. So I think focusing on those things, I don't think ultimately is going to make a huge amount of difference. And I think we are just useful idiots for for big tech. The environmental angle, I think, might have more traction with policymakers because you cannot deny it. The great thing about tech is you can always say with ed tech, oh, yeah, but look, there's an example here where education technology works really well with students from aut with autistic backgrounds, blah, 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 blah. And of course, there is, I can give you 101 examples of where technology is great for education, but they're very contextually bounded. They're, they're very local. No one size fits all. But it's easy for people to say, ah, but technology works here, here and here. Whereas I think as we go on in decades, it's going to be very, very difficult to argue that technology use does not have environmental consequences and is fundamentally bad for the planet. So I'm going to push the, the, the environmental issue. Do start, keep pushing the everything else, the political, the cultural, the social. They're all part of the same problem. But um, yeah, maybe I've just got a bit tired of trying to push those angles. And I, I, and I think ultimately they are, I, I, this accusation of critty hype has kind of, uh, I, I do feel a bit seen. So maybe I'm just, um, I've lost my nerve a bit. But, you know, you know we can crit criticise from all angles. But we shouldn't be sceptical. We shouldn't be cynical. We can be sceptical, but not cynical. I'm not arguing that technology is all terrible. And, you know, clearly technology is wonderful. I'm doing this today. But in the big scheme of things, on a, on a, on a wide scale basis, technology isn't, isn't fair. It does lead to harms. But that's not to say that there aren't more local ways that we could be using it. And that's kind of where the degrowth thing is coming from. Let's keep the essence of, of where, where technology can be good in small localized settings and, and, and use it in those ways. So that was a rambling answer, but um, yeah, I'm a baddie. That was the, the upshot of that answer. Sagar, you can uh, thank you so much, Professor Selman. We've been reading a lot of your uh, papers for our course, so it's great to like have you here and speak to us. Uh, my question stems from a very personal, like on a very personal level. I'm from India, and there's been a rise of fascism within my country. So even though I would advocate for something like a communal-based uh, learning environment, the circumstances have been such that communities have been disrupted by religion, politics, and you know even economic uh, levels. Like we've seen that there's there is going to be an increase in inequalities, and that is going to result in civil wars and things like that. So when we scale down to that level where we allow communities to speak for themselves, and while that that is a great idea, how do you think it will pan out in terms of just education being the vehicle for that change in um, the effect on the students and their lives? That's a really good question. Um, whilst you were talking, and I, I can't get my computer to work, all I can see is U, U6, and I, I was going to Google something whilst you were talking. There's a book that's just come out. I'm not sure if it's called Resisting AI, but it's about a kind of anti-fascist response to AI. One of the arguments is that AI, is, as, as you said, is, is bound up with far-right kind of fascist um, leanings. I don't know if um, it's called resisting AI. I'll, I'll find it later and, and let you know. But there's some people thinking about that. You're, you're completely right. 
So the problem with all of these arguments about it, or we should look to the community is that who are the community? And often when you find the community, they're not nice people. We're doing a research project at the moment about facial recognition technology in Australia. Uh, and there's a state in Australia that's rolling out facial recognition across the city centre. So we got involved and um, the, 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 the city council allowed us to have a community meeting, a town hall, as they called it. This happened last week. And um, yeah, the community turned up, um, but there were mainly five five G anti vaxxers, and and they just completely disrupted the whole thing. But they were very anti facial recognition as well, because facial recognition was part of the deep state. So we had this two hour debate or fight with these two hundred people in the town hall. Uh, there were sixty police uh, and a big protest outside. So in terms of impact. But I also began to think we were all talking about why well, we should allow the community to self-determine how facial recognition. No, no. So that's the problem with the community. You're, you're quite right. And that is actually a problem with, with all kind of um, I, you know, ICT for D work and development work and everything else. We can over romanticize what the community is. And a lot of what I've said um, depends upon there being functional, cohesive communities that work well. So what we're also arguing for is just local forms of democracy, which is which is always a problem. The same when you say the government should be more involved. That's one of my other favourite kind of, um, you know, we need to get the government more involved and push back against Google and Amazon. And then you get students in Vietnam saying, you know, there's no way I'd want our government any more involved in anything that we do. So it's really tricky. And then it just all falls away. And what we're arguing for is we just want a better world, more democratic schools, more democratic countries. You know, we don't want Modi in power anymore, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's tricky. So, yeah, good communities, communities that are not fascist and um, harmful, definitely. So, yeah, this is yeah, this is where you have to kind of the rubber hits the road. So I'm, I'm thinking about how I practically enact this. And I think you have to have very, very small steps. So in terms of research projects, for example, we're not going to suddenly get money to do degrowthing, but we might get money to work with a school and its local community in terms of and that's why schools are really useful because schools are actually places where communities do come together and are hopefully not so nasty to each other so working with schools is actually a really nice place to model this and you get community buy-in from parent groups and from other kind of local businesses and eco centers and you might get a repair group working and you might get some recycling going and begin to do things on a small scale level um clearly wouldn't work in some contexts where schools haven't got that kind of, you know, community bond, but just little experiments like that might start working. And I think that's why education is a really interesting place to do all of this. Clearly, everything I've said could also be argued in fields of ad tech or med tech or fintech or any other tech you want to talk about. But ed tech is where we work. But education is a place where local communities do come together. And suddenly when people become parents, they suddenly become a lot more empathetic towards other people and everything else. And so schools are a nice place to do this. The other in, the other argument is, and this is, comes again from the degrowth literature, that any change cannot be just done on a on a on a one by one basis. These aren't things we can tackle on a, even a national basis. It has to be a global response. And education is a global concern. Education has is globally prominent. Education is a space that it, everyone has kind of in common. So it's a really interesting place to start doing this. And then hopefully we can embarrass fintech, medtech, adtech and every other type of tech into doing it. So I'm not saying education technology is the worst climate polluter in the world or anything like that. But it's actually a really good place to start. And it's the place where we all work. So let's let's talk about that. But yeah, you're right. Um, as soon as you meet the community, often they're not as nice as you, you imagine they are. No. Thanks, Neil. Really interesting. Um, sorry, my team isn't working very well either. So <laughs> my little hand raising, etc. It's not working very well. Um, oh, just a quick one. I just found the book Resisting AI, which is by Dan McQuillan. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Tony was talking about it on Twitter. <laughs> um, so it's getting a lot of uh, attention, I think, this week. Good. Um, so in the spirit of just, you know, general discussion, um, uh, I really like the ideas, but I'm just wondering in, um, in the grand scheme of things, you know, um, and this may be a bit pessimistic and maybe overly so, um, will anything really change? So if you think about it on the micro level of us all using Teams, 
that's purely because it's a business tool and the cloud is still going to be there, et cetera. Um, so that's not really going to change. If you think about um, the pandemic, everyone was talking about flights, fly less, you know, carbon offset of your flights. The actual biggest impact was from energy consumption, you know, people eating their houses, et cetera. Um, mm. is, uh, businesses, heavy industry. And then if you think about it at the, the um, macro level, I guess, in terms of geopolitically, you've seen with the war in Ukraine, at least in Europe, you know, let's ramp up the coal burning fire stations in Germany, for example, because they're so dependent on gas. Um, and so the shift seems to be more, at least in the last few months, and maybe again, this is overly really pessimistic, going in the other direction mm. in the sense of, um, I would have thought maybe even two years ago, climate issues, you know, modular technologies, et cetera, um, were kind of higher on the agenda than they seem to be now. If you look at the way it, lots of industries are going, I was just thinking of the car industry, for example, you know, 50 microprocessors in cars. I saw something yeah. yesterday about subscri subscription that enables them to do subscription models for heating the seats in your car, for example. So And those ones for an airbag as well, isn't there? So yeah, if you hadn't exactly. paid your airbag subscription, it wouldn't open. So the whole way in which it seems to be going is, is away from what you're talking about. I completely mm -hmm. agree with where you're coming from, what you're talking about, but it just seems to me the general shift other than, for example, communities, you know, like, um, you know, say no to oil or just say no to oil. I can't remember the exact name and this kind of direct action, um, at least in the UK, which seems very limited and just painted as completely radical um, by those in power. It doesn't seem to be a, a continuing shift in, in the right direction, other than some greenwashing around net zero. So just wondering in terms of where you're positioning yourself or where how this conversation you see developing over the next, you know, maybe five to 10 years or 15 years that you mentioned already. Sorry, that was a bit of a long winded comment. But. No, no, no. Honestly, I think this is something that's I'm doing this for the next 100 years. I think um, you have to imagine this is not just a generational problem. This is just something that's going to have to go on for a long, long, long time. So, yeah, I think we have to get away from the idea that this is a, a kind of finite problem that we can address in our lifetime. I don't think it is at all. So I fully expect nothing's really going to happen for another 30, 40 years. The direction of travel, as you say, isn't in the right direction whatsoever. Um, just to, whilst you were talking, there's a, I can idealise another another group of people here and say, well, it's all about the young people. We're too old. We, we are cynical. Perhaps schools are full of young people that are a bit more hopeful, willing to do things, and maybe a little bit of local action within schools from the very, very young might be the way forward. Schools don't need as much technology as they've got. You don't need to have this huge, big $2,000 computer with a amazing word processor to get a five-year-old to write a poem. So the idea of using a Raspberry Pi to write a poem, you know, makes sense. You can do it. And I think kids can see that. So schools are a nice little space to kind of foster this, this minor counter thinking against technology, but it's going to be small steps. So maybe the young people, maybe schools, there was, so again, I get all my information from Twitter these days. Um, there was some some conference going on in Spain, I think, a critical ed tech thing that Nick Coldrey was speaking at. And they had the French Minister for Digital Technology. And they were talking about all sorts of stuff they're doing in France that I, wasn't, I hadn't kept up to speed with in terms of French open source, um, nationwide uses of technology. Yeah, yeah. It, it did seem a little bit more, um, yeah, less kind of commercial and a little bit more, you know, open access, open source, open education resources. If you can get a country like France doing stuff like that, which has quite fascistic leanings, you could argue, in some, in some places, maybe there is some hope. So I don't know. I'm becoming more hopeful in my old age, but then I'm a contrarian, so... <laughs> It was always good yeah, never absolutely. to be hopeful. But honestly, the climate crisis isn't going to go away, whether we start burning coal fires or, or whatever. You know, we're having terrible flooding at the moment here. Um, there's also the winds. It's awful, honestly. I was actually, yeah, my visceral wake up call was about five years ago. I've got kids now and we had our last day of term and it was 46 degrees and it was full of smoke because the bushfires were going and the, the sky was red and we all came to pick the kids up and we had to have like a, this ceremony where everybody throws their hats in the air and all the parents were just standing around pretending that it, this wasn't happening because it was just like bloody in Dante's Inferno. 
and you're just looking at each other. You just felt so just dispir- dispirited, all these little five-year-olds and six-year-olds that just thought this was normal. And you're just like, oh, man. So anyway, that really got me going personally. Um, really, I should have been much more aware of it before then. So, yeah, we're going to carry on more tech. And I think, as I said at the beginning, the business as usual model is going to be the path that we're going to go down for the next decade or two decades or three decades. But, you know, in the 2060s, 2070s, I hope we'll look back on two devices per child or, you know, streaming stuff on your smartphone will be like smoking in pubs. And you'd be like, why the hell were they doing that? Isn't that just nut- that's nuts in terms of, you know, societal benefits. So maybe if we can make using digital technology the new smoking. And we've shifted on smoking. We've shifted on petrol cars. We've shifted on all sorts of stuff. So, you know, be hopeful. But me and you are going to be well dead before anything really happens. <laughs> the rest of you will be fine. You all look much younger and brighter than we do. <laughs> on that note, I've hung over for, for another question. Thanks, Neil. Um, so we have three minutes left, and I think we, we have time for a couple more questions. So if you got them, raise your hand. Um, Ted? Hey, yeah, thank you. Um, smoking has become a little bit passe, but in France it has not. So uh, take everything, I guess, with a grain of salt. Um, I also, um, I have some pretty dystopic scenes of classrooms where you have like pods. This, every student has a device, every pod has a device, and there's a smart board in the front which, you know, is being built as some sort of like accessible classroom, but really makes me, gives me pause. Um, I'm, I think I'm probably most provoked by the idea of sort of middle-class agitation, just because I, I feel like in ed tech, I mean, there are ed tech pr- practitioners, people who are fa- or parents and, and who are former educators and who come from all walks, sort of walks of life and different perspectives. I think there's sort of something interesting there about um, sort of building momentum among sort of people who maybe aren't necessarily the, the decision makers in sort of deploying technology and aren't necessarily funding technologies, but maybe have a, perhaps more like sort of visceral reaction to some of the things that, you know, we are talking about here. Um, and, you know, I, I'm also sort of um, torn between this idea of like incremental change and personal action, which, you know, we were all convinced that recycling was the way to go in the 90s. Um, by big corporations, uh, and we're you know we're constantly being told to do certain things, and then this idea that you know at the government level things, um, especially in the United States, doesn't seem like climate change legislation is anywhere on the horizon. Um, so I'm I'm I am provoked by the this how we might be able to mobilize certain groups of people to sort of push push for change. I mean this you know I think lots of possibilities there in terms of climate change, uh, more responsible commute computing, um, and um also like privacy related issues data data surveillance all those sorts of things that i think could probably resonate with certain audiences so i'm this isn't really a question just sort of a uh, a thought uh but out there i'm i'm most wondering about sort of best the best messages that we might actually sort of research and leverage to push the push the needle from multiple directions because obviously even though de-schooling society would be the best option probably solve a lot of a lot of problems um for now we have a limited set of tools and uh, so it's sort of my my thought. But yeah, education's a really education's a really emotive area. People are very you know it's their children with other children. So it, 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 it shifts the dial away from thinking this, this is an individual obligation that you know some of us should get fair phones and stop using you know devices. It's not an individual thing. So I think that's why schools and the education systems makes people think on this scaled up kind of. Um, um, perspective. So that's why I'm kind of taken with w- doing this kind of stuff in schools. Um, and I think it is a place to engage the kind of the, mi- the middle classes who are suddenly very concerned about their children, but it kind of manifests itself in being concerned for, for kind of for, for groups. So yeah, it, it's it's tricky and it is a provocation. And I'm just saying these things out loud. I've got no, the ideas are great and it's nice to talk about them. What you actually do, I have no idea. Um, and hopefully what I'm hoping is because every time I've done something in Oxford, the students are a really bright but they go on to like kind of start ngos or start their own companies or work for government so i think if i can just say these things now in about three years time when you go off and work for wherever it is um remember this (laughs) try and get some smarter people to work out what it is they have to do so it's a bit of a kind of sleeper sleeper idea but you're right i mean yeah it's not just an individual thing it can't be and 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 also 
getting these messages into big big tech corporations is really interesting as well. I'm quite interested in, in people that work for big tech and the resistance that's taking place within these communities. I mean, the AI shifts that have taken place over the past couple of years in Google, for example. And then you've got things like um, Tibnip Guru and, the, and that, D, is it D-A-I-R? D-I-A-R? The AIR and, and these these kind of like industry wide groups and they, so there's a big collective pushback there so that's perhaps somewhere else to maybe agitate within the tech community that are doing these things as well. Mm, that was more of a that wasn't even an answer was it to your non question? Thank you so much, Neil. Um, and we're two minutes over, so now do you have any concluding notes? Um, no, just to, to thank Neil really and, and to for a very illuminating and interesting thought provoking talk. I think there's lots there to get our, our heads around and, you know, readings to follow up on, et cetera. So, Neil, thank you. And I know it's getting late for you as well. And your videos. Yeah, no worries. Much Imagine again. how good it would have been if you'd seen the slides. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yes. It would have been so much better. That's just a further use of technology. We don't need. Right? Well, don't, yeah, teams. Teams is the work of the devil, honestly. Well, it's been lovely to see you all. And um, yeah, have a lovely summer. But also, I would say that you're really lucky to be able to do the, the course in Oxford. You got some really good shit. Rebecca's really good as well, as you know, and I'm always really impressed by the quality of uh, yeah what goes on. So yeah, you're you're in a good place. Thank you very much, Neil. And you know, as we said, we use your work a lot and your groups work a lot. So yes, the feeling is is mutual. And I just want to end by um thanking sort of Zushi and Yi, Carmen and Elm for organisation. They did a lot of the, the heavy lifting. So thanks to them for making really successful um seminar series. Um, all of which the videos will be online on YouTube, and we'll share all those. So I guess all that means me to do is, like Neil, wish you all a, a very nice summer and good luck with your thesis, etc. And um, yeah, uh, enjoy the rest of your days and evenings. Thanks, everyone. See you soon.